Hello, I'm Maria Hall-Brown, and this is LA Currents. Forgive everybody everything. Is it possible? Well, my guest today says that you should at least try. I'm delighted to be joined by the founder of Homeboy Industries, the remarkable father, Greg Boyle. So nice to have you here. Good to be here. It's been a long road. You've been, I mean, Homeboy Industries in the last, you know, it's been around for the last three decades plus. How has the landscape of Los Angeles, in particular with gang life, changed from when you first were at St. Dolores Mission to what you see out there now? Yeah, it certainly has changed. I mean, 35 years Homeboy Industries has been around, but I've been, you know, closer to 40 years working with gang members. Sure. So it's, it's, uh, nothing like the early days 88 to 98 which was the decade of death that was just horrifying so though I, i'm still bearing kids you know it's nothing compared to those days so has there been a kind of a calming down of how many gangs are in los angeles because it's a very complex city or has there been just a shift as to what that word means I don't know if there, it, you know, a, a gang member is a gang member at this point, you know, though you might have tag bangers, people who tag, and then they fight each other, fight, you know, one tagging crew against another tagging crew. They still have the number somewhere at 120,000 gang members and 1,100 gangs. So whether that's up to date or accurate, I think it's the one they use. And so, you know, so you have waves, you know, you have people who, uh, pulled back after the whole horrific decade of which I previously spoke. And then, you know, things kind of have moments where it gets exacerbated. So you had the, the COVID, this, now we're kind of in a post-COVID resurgence probably, you know, so, um, so there is thing, things happening. What happens is the younger group that's kind of stepping up don't have very much collective memory of how horrible it was. And, and immediately after that, people said, yeah, I don't want any part of this. Right. And, and so no hopeful kid has ever joined a gang. So the ones who had a kind of a pilot light of hope were able to step away. Now there isn't very much memory of what that was like. You know what I don't know? Because I know that you were at St. Dolores Mission and I know that this whole thing started as jobs for opportunity sort of thing. But I don't know, who helped you put all this together? How is it? How is it practically created? Because it's now a global um, impact, you know, organization. But you know, back in the late '80s, early '90s, it was you experience a great idea. But you know, who helped you build it? And how did it happen? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you know, there are a lot of people who were part of it. It was that community that from which it was born, and so and mainly women with children, that was the profile mm -hmm. of folks who lived in those two housing projects. So we're, we're always responding. It, there was at no point where, where you think up an entire thing, right. where you go, oh, I know we'll have this huge headquarters in Chinatown. It, you know, it was, you added things, you subtracted things. You said, well, maybe tattoo removal. And, uh, and then folks weren't hiring at the rate that we needed them to hire and so we said well let's start things ourselves you know maintenance crew landscaping crew and and that all, all to service and to minister really to the members of the eight gangs in in my parish and then we evolved you know and then we were dealing with the 10,000 gang members in Hollenbeck a police precinct and then well now we serve every corner of the county and beyond. Beyond is, is the global homeboy network. So that's, we didn't want to franchise mm -hmm. and, and airlift homeboy into Wichita, but we wanted to, you know, help people who, who believed in our model. And if they want to start that in Chicago, we'll help you do that. And then they become loosely connected to this partnership we call the global homeboy network. So we have 300 programs in the United States and 50 outside the country that have a connection to Homeboy. We just had our gathering, our 10th one, for three days, our, our partners who can make it from all over the world come to LA. Do you still actively participate? Obviously, you travel a lot, you speak a lot, you know, you do the, the thought of the day, you know, on, on um, YouTube, et cetera, but 
but, you know, as far as the practical nature of everything, are you still able to get your hands on everything and say, nope, we're stopping that one. Yep, we're expanding that well, one. Well, kind of. I mean, I, 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 I have a very limited amount of juice left in my <laughs> juice card, but I, I still, you know, uh, I'm emeritus kind of. I mean, I have a CEO, I have a COO, a CDO, a CFO. <laughs> All those I'm, C's. I, I'm sure we have a UFO somewhere <laughs> in there. And um, and then the homies have kind of uh, stepped up. So, you know, the executive uh, assistant, executive director, vice presidents of programming, that kind of thing, are all gang members who've come up through the program. And now they run the place. So if I step back, they'll step up. And so I, you know, so I was just there now. I've been gone, you know, uh, so every once in a while, I'll, I'll say, hey, hire, the, bring that guy in. Well, in the interim, you know what I want to ask really quick before we get too far. You are a servant of God, but an employee of the church. Did you have to ask permission to be able to do this when you left St. Dolores to be able to, to create this? I mean, how does that work within, you know, the hierarchy of the church? Yeah, well, I'm a Jesuit, so I... I it, so it's not, I answer to my provincial, mm -hmm. and so my provincial assigns me, or moves me, mm -hmm. or allows me. So he's, he's my chief. So, yeah, so, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, so. Well, I'm glad he said yes. Yes, I'm glad too. Okay. Um, in those time, in this time, you know, you have written books, you have obviously been very contemplative about what's going on. The whole homeboy industry realm has changed, but a critical part of what has really, I think, helped were these ACE tests. What exactly, I mean, I know, because I looked it up, but what is an ACE test and how has that helped you understand the population that you're really working with? Well, it's really a measure of trauma and damage and how much kids have. So it's the adverse childhood experiences. So you, there's a whole list of them, you know, alcoholic parent, uh, you know, a parent in prison, the presence of uh, mental health issues, abuse of every imaginable kind, physical, sexual, emotional. Uh, and then you, you check it, you know, the, 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 you self-administer normally or perhaps in an interview. And, and so it, it tells you kind of on a scale, it was one to 10 kind of things that you can identify. And uh, so obviously a, we're, we're kind of a, a trauma-informed community in as much as everybody has, walks through our doors has, you know, comes with what a psychologist would call disorganized attachment. You know, mom was frightened or frightening. And you really can't calm yourself down if you've never been soothed. So, so we believe in a, in a community, a culture that cherishes. So you create a safe place, people feel seen, then they feel cherished. And that's kind of the, the formula for somebody to become sturdy and resilient. And, and even in the face of, you know, an eight on the... Uh, ACE uh, study. So, um, so they transform their pain so they don't have to inflict it anymore or transmit it. And so, and that's essential. So, you know, we talk about an 18 month training program, which is really a, the same amount of time that it takes for an infant to attach to the caregiver. Oh. So, it's a kind of a similar model that it, attachment is, attachment repair is possible. And that's what gets restored. Now, you know, healing ends in the graveyard for all of us. But there's a kind of fundamental, foundational, essential healing that can happen in 18 months if, if, you've, if you surrender to it. So safe, seen, and cherished. I mean, those are beautiful words. But I think one of the things that in any situation is consistency. So past that 18 months, making sure the consistency remains so that whatever progressive move and whatever situations might have you know, been sewn together with loving healing 
don't unravel on you? How do you, how do you make sure that all those people that have been impacted, affected, and s safe, seen, and, and cherished stay that way? Yeah, well, you don't, you know? Oh. Yeah, it's a little bit like rehab. You know, somebody goes to a rehab for a drug addiction or alcohol, and, you know, it's kind of on you to, to be able to... So if you go to rehab, you know, the people in the rehab center aren't constantly, are you okay? I mean, you have, you know, uh, certainly sponsors and people you check in with, and we have the same thing. But, you know, no amount of me wanting that guy to have a life is the same as that guy wanting to have a life. So you, you kind of you require it, but then it becomes sort of part of the air you breathe. And then homeboy is a touchstone. You come home as you would anyone would go home, you know, to kind of revive a sense of belonging and, and uh, I'm okay. And, and that happens all the time here where people, um, I keep pointing to our headquarters, which is right <laughs> over there. I see it. Yes, yeah, there it is. So, um, and, you know, just last week, you know, I had uh, two guys come in on the same day, and I go, what are you doing here? Well, they, they were all there just to get their fix, you know, people knowing their name and paying attention to them and hugging them, and, yeah. and then they're good. You know, they, maybe, they're not, maybe they don't find that so much at their current employment, but it, once somebody discovers that loving is their home, then they'll never be homesick. Yeah. And so you want them to carry that with them, whether they're working at Homeboy or not. When someone is so deeply part of the gang life and, you know, they learn, how, did, how can you get them assimilated back into sort of the mainstream existence, you know, jobs, family, culture, lifestyle, et cetera? How, how is that transition practically done? Yeah, so at Homeboy, we make the distinction between content and context. Content is secondary to context. So context is, do you feel cherished? Do you, do you know that you're unshakably good? Do you have a sense of being, of belonging in a community that's cherishing you? That's the context. The content, we, we're, we're so content heavy. You know, we, not Homeboy, but society. We think they don't know enough, they're not trained enough, they're not smart enough. If only we could insert message here and teach them how to do all these things to assimilate. But the truth is, once people are healed, it's really not an issue. You know, once, once you've come to terms with what was done to you and what you've done, then you're at a place where you go, oh yeah, I can, I can work there and I can work there. So it's, I think we, we overthink this a little bit, that it's, it's about something else. If, if people are finding a hard time assimilating to the real world, well, it's just because people have, haven't done the work yet and that they haven't found healing, which almost always happens in, in a community that welcomes you. So, so do that and then watch what happens to their ability to blend in you know, I have this theory that loneliness is the great soul destroyer. You know, obviously you talk about trauma, but I also think that a lot of the, some of these wonderful programs that are trying to help, you know, lift a person out of whatever they're in, forget that whole thing about loneliness. It doesn't matter if you're sitting in a room and you've got a roof over your head, but if you're lonely, if you don't have someone to talk to, someone who sees you, someone who's there for you, someone who loves you, then no amount of you know, tactile things are going to ever help. And I think that's one of the things that Homeboy, as you just very clearly outlined, brings to someone is that they won't have to ever feel lonely. They might be alone, but knowing that they can go home or they can have that person, it's their person that will see them. Yeah, so only connect. And so that's, that's what you hope for, you know, and... And so a loving, caring adult who pays attention. Mm -hmm. and, and it would be nice to have, you know, say your biological parents who, are, who have some of that role. But a lot of folks don't. And so that's okay. Then, you know, then you find it in the culture of the community that holds you, you know. And then, then you become 
that sanctuary that you were seeking all along. You become it. And then you go home to your kids and, and you present here. Here's what I've learned. Here's what I know. And then suddenly you've broken a cycle, which is very important. So, you know, it's funny. You see homies and homegirls who are parents and how they parent and, and really different than they had been parented. And there's a kind of a confidence. They go, well, yeah, my kid's not going to join a gang. Aww. Not because there's an iron fist behind it. It's because they've created homes where their kids are hopeful. And, uh, and that's, that's the only guarantee. If your kid is hopeful, he's not going to join a gang. Right. And, and so they've really created that, which is quite thrilling to watch. I know you've spoken a million times that there's no actual success that you want to pin anything on, that it's a constant, you know, it's a journey. And as I said, you know, forgive everyone for everything. You know, there's a lot of forgiving that has to be done over and over again. Um, but I imagine that, you know, being an idealistic, optimistic person, you have, you know, you, how would you like to see, um, what's, the, what's your dream for, not just the organization, but in general with, you know, these people who have suffered so much trauma? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're all so remarkable. I mean, just spending two hours right now in my office, you know, they're, you, you, you're aware of what they carry. You stand in awe, affectionate awe at, at what they've had to carry rather than in judgment at how they carry it. And so, but just extraordinary things. I mean, at things that I've never had to carry in my 69 years of living. So, in a, so I'm just, it's a remarkable kind of thing. And yet, they're able to stay so gracious and loving and, and, and the room brightens when they walk in, even though they're, they're navigating things that are quite, quite difficult. So, but there's something palpable about, you know, the place itself, you know, it's not just about delivering services like you're the DMV, anger management or, you know, therapy or tattoo removal. We do all those things, but they're all secondary to, to the welcome that somebody feels when they go there. So, and that's an essential thing, you know, where, how do people feel? You know, the homies, we have so many who have done 25 to 30 years in prison. And, and they'll say, I'm used to being watched. I'm not used to being seen. Oh. And so you have that palpable experience. So much so that in the old days, we would fret if, you know, would somebody, if they get popped or go get arrested or get high or relapse, will they come back? And we would lament that. And now nobody says, will they come back? They all say, they'll be back. Because it's so compelling to have had a dose of this that they all come back and they all beg to come back into the program, even though, you know, they've, it got difficult for them to really see themselves and maybe acknowledge their pain. So your dream? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, you don't have one? I don't know if I do it that way. I mean, I just want to put one foot in front of the next. I don't have like, you know, conquer the world dreams or... Uh, you know, today, Los Angeles, tomorrow, <laughs> California. But yeah, I, I don't really think in those terms. I, I try to, you want to be faithful and less uh, outcome obsessed. Mm -hmm. I, I'm outcome aware, but I'm not outcome obsessed. Let's talk about faith a little bit. What does it mean to be a Jesuit priest? What is the difference in, 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 because um, obviously, you know, a child of eight, you're one of eight, you had a calling, and you were called to the Jesuits. The Jesuits have a very particular modality of, of service. So what does it mean to you to be a Jesuit priest? Well, I was educated by the Jesuits, so I was kind of drawn to them. I liked their joy. I liked their hilarity. I liked their prophetic stance in the world. And, and I was drawn to them during the time of the Vietnam War. And so, so people like Daniel Berrigan who were getting arrested and I, you know, I kind of liked, I, I said, yeah, I, I like the combo burger of hilarity and, and the prophetic kind of stance in those days. So 
Yeah, so the Jesuits have, you know, founded by St. Ignatius, so they have a spirituality and a kind of a understanding of how, what, what is your stance to be at the margins, you know, how will you stand there? So that's quite rich, you know. So, you know, we're, we're large, you know, as a religious uh, community um, order, as they call it. And the Pope is, you know, a Jesuit. So, I mean, there's a, you know, there's a kind of a spirituality mainly mm -hmm. of how to see the world and how to stay, how to find God and everything. Along those lines, I'm, as a Jesuit priest who has such a strong faith, and you look at these, you look at the people that you've worked with that have experienced so much trauma or maybe even caused trauma, do you ever turn to the Lord and say, why did, why is this allowed to be happen? I mean, this is a little along the lines of people say, you know, why is there suffering in the world? But at the same time, you've seen, you know, people experience things that shouldn't happen. How does that work in, with a man of yeah, faith? Yeah, I, I don't, you know, I don't think God has anything to do with it. You know, God protects me mm -hmm. from nothing and sustains me. In everything and so you know um, just homie driving me over here today you know we were talking about that and I go yeah you know things are random stuff happens you know people who are mentally ill for example we were talking about that I said they don't choose mental illness it, it chooses them in a very random nobody knows why or how now do I think you know, that God has anything to do with the horrible things? Well, of course not. You know, and why would we make, you know, God an accomplice in all this? You know, and, and God is rooting for us. You know, that we will choose kinship and love and connection mm -hmm. over division and, you know, polarity. And, and so God's dream come true is is no us and them, just us. God's dream come true is a community of cherished belonging, you know, that you may be one, as Jesus says. So that's the hope. You know, it's, it's a self-effacing God. We're not so self-effacing, so we project that onto God, like that God is saying it's all about me. Right. Whereas God is trying to say, no, it's about you. And here, you can do this. You know, if, if people are killing each other, it's in your power not to do that. Not because it's right or wrong, but because we're all trying to walk each other home to health and wellness and wholeness and, and none of us are well until all of us are well. So how do we help each other, you know? And, and, and so you believe that everybody's unshakably good and that we belong to each other. Once you believe those two principles, then you can roll up your sleeves and actually do things that will help us make progress. And once you believe you are good, you don't want to betray that. That's right, yeah, and, but you don't become good. You, you discover that you've always been. How about the whole idea of keeping Homeboy Industries going um, just on a pragmatic stand? What do you need from people who might be listening or watching and could be inspired to help? Yeah. Well, we always need help, you know, uh, because we're, we're a $40 million annual operation. So the minute that $40 million every year goes out the door, we have to raise another $40 million. So $10 million of it comes from our businesses. A lot of people think, oh, they're fully self-supporting, but, you know, we have 500 people. So there's, it's hard to um, sustain all that. So... And we've had horrible moments in our 35 years where, you know, 2010, I had to uh, lay off 300 workers. And so it was tough. So we haven't had a moment like that since then. So, but it's always hard. You know, you want people to recognize it. So we're not just, you know, we're kind of the front porch of the house everybody wants to live in. So mm -hmm. if you look at complex social dilemma in our country, from the unhoused to the mental health crisis to disaffected youth to, to the justice system. 
you know, Homeboy is kind of a model of how you would approach this. And so even on our global Homeboy network, you know, it's not, it's not just, you know, people dealing with gang members in, you know, Glasgow, Scotland. It's, you know, it's, there's gang members and then there's also returning citizens from prison. But they've also been able to take this model and apply it to dealing with homeless and, and mental health. Whatever it is, it's a kind of a, a model that's really quite helpful. And because of that, we're, I think we're worthy of funding, you know, where people will say, and, and we've have been pretty diverse in, you know, our sources of our streams of money. You know, mainly a lot of friends who, and small donations who kind of keep us going. And then, you know, it, it, the government piece has never been as, as large as it probably ought to be, city, state, county, federal. Uh, but, you know, you, know you, you announce this message that this is a really viable model, not just for gang members, but whatever it is that in your city you find vexing, this is a model that, that can be applied. And that wasn't my idea. That was sort of people coming, you know, from Detroit, I'm presuming, that, like, for example, that they're, they want to deal with kind of gang issues and no they they came they want to deal with the unhoused and how can this model be applied well that's what i was going to ask you i imagine that not only are you you know the house but everybody wants to come and get the plans so so you just answered that people are coming to you and saying how can we do this versus you sitting at a board meeting saying let's expand into yeah we never do that and and we were always responding to people who who uh, wanted us to you know, airlift homeboy into Wichita, you know. Mm -hmm. And and so we had to make the decision, do we want to do that? And then we said no. So we'll give technical assistance. So so there's tour groups all the time from all over the world, eight a day probably, where they come in stakeholders from various cities and countries who who want to explore, you know, how can we apply this? And so maybe they stay several days and they hang out and 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 so it's you know you some things don't compute you know tattoo removal doesn't make any sense in scotland but it makes a lot of sense in guatemala city so so they kind of pick and choose and glean what you know uh, has translating ability to their own locale so uh, so that's been a kind of a helpful thing. And, and again, the homies sit them down or they'll spend, you know, several days where they sit in on classes or, or maybe their interests are, are the mental health piece or the curricular piece or whatever it is. What is the thing that you love to do the most? What, you know, by yourself, not, not in a room, not whether, uh, you know, do you want to read a book? Do you want to have a cup of tea? Do you want to, you know, watch reality television? Do you want to do, what's a, what's a light-hearted thing that would be slightly surprising to people who don't know you well, but obvious to those who do? I don't know, I like to walk. Walking is kind of a thing I like to do. So I don't always have the time to be able to do it, but I just like it. I like to walk and think thoughts and, and, and kind of unravel things and go, huh, what if it's about that? Well, I know that you have a packed schedule, and I know that you have a lot on your plate, but if people want to learn more about what's happening with Homeboy Industries or listen to, you know, words of wisdom or learn about more of your books, et cetera, what's the best way for them to find out everything? Well, they can go to our website, homeboyindustries.org. Mm -hmm. You could go there. And then it could connect you to the Facebook page and I don't know, all that stuff. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And that's a wrap on this LA Currents. <laughs>